people in the sanctuary this morning. Good to see you all. This is our second installment of Presbyterian Hymnody. Now, as I explained in our last session, session 15, that there really is no boundary to say this is Presbyterian hymns and that is not. Uh, there was a lot of borrowing going on right from the get-go. When we looked at the Reformation, we saw a lot of borrowing going on. We saw a lot of things like, for example, the English Reformation using Lutheran hymns that were translated. We looked at things like the uh, Calvinist churches especially in Scotland, the starting of the Presbyterian churches, drawing from Luther as well as from the Calvinist movements in Switzerland with the Genevan Psalter. So there was a lot of borrowing going on and the same thing happened in the New World. So when all those reformers and Lutherans and Catholics and everybody moved to the New World, they brought all that tradition and history with them. And the same thing, of course, happened in Canada. Now, hymn writing and hymnody as such, regardless of what denomination or sect of the Christian faith it was, in Canada was actually very slow in taking off in terms of coming up with their own material on home ground. For the longest time, for example, the Presbyterian Church held on to the old Scottish Psalter right up into the 1800s. Here and there, there was an original tune popping up. It wasn't always by a Presbyterian per se. A lot of Anglicans started writing original works here in Canada and the Methodists and Baptists. It was only much later on that the Presbyterians really started writing their own original material, sort of late 1800s coming into the early 1900s even. But there's some fascinating stories behind them. It's also interesting to note how much of our hymns that originate from Canada were written by immigrants coming into the country. They weren't always born and raised in Canada. Many of them, for example, were born in Britain, England, or Scotland, and settled here and became Canadian citizens. And then, of course, like I said, there's a lot of borrowing. The Presbyterian Church used, still used a lot of stuff from the Lutherans, a lot of material from the Anglicans, from the English tradition, Methodist, Baptist, you name it. So there was a lot of that going on. Also, the other congregations were using a lot of material written by the Scottish and the Presbyterians. So there was a whole lot of borrowing going on. There was no clear-cut boundaries. So Presbyterians way back were singing old gospel hymns from the South, from the USA. There was a strong influence from the States still, especially New England in Presbyterian hymnody. Earlier on in other sessions, I spoke about the harmonies books, like the Southern harmonies and you know the, the, the Southern harp books, those shape note books, oblong books that were used and people sang without accompaniment, that carried on right into Eastern Canada until eventually they came up with their own edition. The tunes to these hymns and even some of the words were from England, Germany, France, Scotland. So again, you know, even though there was this harp harmony singing tradition going all along the Eastern seaboard of North America, a lot of the tunes and the hymns were actually coming from the old world. I found, this was an, an incredible find, a beautiful old book published in 1908 by Reverend A. Wiley. I'm assuming this is pronounced Mahon, Ma, Ma, Mahon? <laughs> Mahon, okay, there we go, I got corrected. And it is Canadian Hymns and Hymn Writers. Now he doesn't, of course, run the whole gamut of all the writers that there are, just some noteworthy ones. And the first one on his list is a William Bullock. Now, William Bullock, of course, if we could go to the next slide. There we go. He was Canadian born. No, he was not. He was dean of Halifax. He was actually dean of a cathedral in Halifax that burned down. 
and uh, it got rebuilt and replaced, of course, so I could find no archives or anything of the old cathedral. I actually wanted to use the pictures. He was born in England, and it doesn't mention where he died. We're assuming it was in Canada. A lot of them did actually go back to, to England when they came from there. So yes, it was St. Luke's Cathedral, Anglican, but highly influential and a lot of other congregations used the material that he wrote. He was also highly involved with uh, writing all sorts of things. You know, a lot of these hymn writers didn't just write hymns. A lot of them wrote children's books. A lot of them wrote historical books and archives. A lot of them wrote all sorts of things. So it's really fascinating and different poem different poems too. Secular poems were very popular, of course, in the Victorian era. Romantic love songs and romantic love poetry and all that. He is best known for an Anglican hymn called We Love the Place, O God, Where in Thine Honor Dwells. And I have actually heard it performed by a choir in Scotland and it is absolutely beautiful. It must have been in a big cathedral where they recorded it with a beautiful echo and a lovely pipe organ. And I have heard it sung here in Canada because I do play for a high Anglican church as well. So a lot of these I have heard, a lot of these have shown up in old, old Presbyterian hymnals, by the way. So although this is generally an expose of Canadian composers of hymns in general, these have appeared in earlier books of praise hymnals. So now I will sing for you, We Love the Place, O God. I'm not going to sing all the verses, typical Anglican hymn, it just goes on forever. So I'm just going to sing three verses instead of seven or eight. As you can hear, it is simple, it is elegant, it gets the message across. Okay, that is typical of music from Britain, and that was inherited in Canada, and also certain churches on the eastern seaboard of the States as well. In fact, as I mentioned in one of the earlier presentations, there was a movement in, uh, in the USA round about this time, the late 1800s, there was a movement to go back to that elegant, simple, but stately hymns because in was coming all the, the hoot nanny hee-haw kind of 
<laughs> kind of rowdy gospel songs, and there was actually a backlash happening. At roughly the same time, there was a backlash happening in Canada too. It was an Anglican movement, and it was corresponding to a movement going on in England called the Oxford Movement, where they wanted to go back to the liturgy, a liturgical church. So they were going back into that sort of cathedral-y type of worship. Our next man on the list is, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Joseph Scriven or Scriven. Now this, uh, this man was born in Ireland, in County Down. However, he did live in Canada and of course he died in Ontario. And you can see the dates there. So this is all Victorian era, right? 1800s coming into the early 1900s is the Victorian era. He wrote a lot of material about the Cape Cod folk. Um, he wrote a lot of po poems about uh, uh, the rough life. His music was very popular with uh, Ira D. Sankey, which of course is a gospel outreach uh, ministry, a, a missionary outreach ministry. Sankey actually used a lot of hymns from many different composers, and once in a while, a very strange, naughty thing would happen where he would be attributed as being the one who originally wrote certain hymns. Until one day there was a lady composer, I'll mention her a little later, a Canadian lady, who got upset because she found one of her hymns in a hymnal and it said, by Ira D. Sankey. <laughs> and so she hunted out and she wanted to make sure that people knew she wrote the hymn and not him. <laughs> she was fine with it being used in, in tent camp revivals and all that kind of stuff but just as long as, as the proper person's name was there. So Joseph, Joseph Scriven wrote a hymn that is popular the world over. Okay, I'm an ex-South African, and I grew up Pentecostal and Dutch Reform. My mom is a Boer, she's Afrikaans, and in the Dutch Reform Church, there are translations of a lot of these hymns. What a friend we have in Jesus was written by Mr. Scriven. And if you think of all the popular gospel singers that have taken it and run with it, it is just absolutely incredible that it was written by an Irishman who moved to Canada and stayed here for the rest of his life. What a friend we have in Jesus. I will sing all four verses. Most of our hymnals just have three. There actually is a last fourth verse that we almost never see. So you are gonna hear it this morning. and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. 
find a friend so faithful who can all our sorrows share. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise for solace there. Blessed Savior, thou hast promised, thou wilt all our burdens bear. We may we ever, Lord, be bringing all to thee in earnest Soon in glory bright unclouded, there will be no need for prayer. Rapture, praise, and endless worship will be our sweet portion. So what did you think of that final verse? I've never heard it before. To be honest, when I first looked at it and they said there will be no need for prayer, I was like, where is this verse going? <laughs> Until I finally read, well, of course, you know, we'll be face to face with Christ, face to face with God. You don't have to pray to God when you're looking him straight in the eye, right? You praise him. So <laughs> I was a little nervous in the beginning. There'll be no need for prayer. And I'm like, oh, okay, where is this heading towards? But it's a very interesting verse, isn't it? Okay, our next gentleman that we're looking at here is Reverend Dr. Robert Murray. Now, this is an actual Presbyterian who writes, who wrote hymns. One of few. I actually read a commentary on the internet, and this person was perhaps not very sympathetic or kind, but he said that writing original material amongst Canadian Presbyterians was abysmal. <laughs> Pretty strong words, isn't it? But the fact of the matter is, is that it all came later. It all developed later, later, later. Because like I said, they were all hooked on the, the, the Scottish tradition and the Scottish hymnals and the Scottish psalms and all that. So later on, they came up with their own material. He was the accomplished editor of the Presbyterian Witness. He had special gifts as a hymn writer and a poet. One thing you need to understand is that quite oftentimes the song, the music, and the words came from two different sources. So he didn't write the music. He actually was a, a, a religious poet. And his poetry, of course, was used for hymns. He was born in Nova Scotia. Oh, he was actually born in Canada and died in Canada. Nova Scotia and Nova Scotia. Well, there you go. There's a Canadian born Presbyterian hymn writer. How about that? He wrote a, <clears throat> a hymn that is very famous amongst national hymns. These are hymns that are used for national occasions, such as, for example, O Canada, I vow for thee, my country, 
and all that kind of material. This hymn is called From Ocean Unto Ocean. And I can tell you what the Anglicans love this hymn. It is used to a very familiar tune, which we use in, on Palm Sunday. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. So the same tune is used. And uh, of course, this is about our country, our country following God, following Christ. And it is just really, really, really rousing. The Anglican Church I play for sings it every single time there's some sort of national something going on somewhere, whether it be a, a Canada Day or BC Day or, or, or one of the World, one, World War I or World War II remembrance uh, uh, significant days. Some of these hymns are very, very hard to find. He wrote another beautiful hymn, but it's very, very hard to find a good copy of it, and it's called Our Blessed Bond of Union. Art thou, O Christ our Lord, the rule of our communion is thine and faithful word. Such lovely words. And you know, to this day, I have no idea why some of these beautiful hymns that are filled with truths fall away and get ditched along the way. I have no idea. It would be so nice for a hymn publishing company to actually bring them back. You know, maybe the tune isn't cool enough or something. I don't know. But these hymns are timeless truths. So I will now sing for you from ocean unto ocean, a real marchy national sounding hymn. Here we go. I'll sing all four verses. Should I? 
unto ocean, a land shall all be Lord. Amen. How about that? So next time you hear that or you get to sing it at a church, remember it's thoroughly Canadian. Also interesting to note is that the older hymnals always have that amen. It was actually written in the score. And uh, that's another one of those things that just fall along the wayside. Our next composer is Edward Hartley, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Dewart? Stuart. Okay, this is another Irishman uh, born in Ireland in County Cavan, Cavan, Cavan. However, he did die in Ontario. So we've got another import from Ireland, the Emerald Isle. Of course, he was a clergyman and he was a clergyman in the Methodist Church of Canada. He wrote a very beautiful hymn, and in this old book, they actually use it as an example. But again, this is very, very difficult hymn to find, or it's hard to find a good copy. Now, you need to understand that a lot of the older hymnals would have the music at the top of the page and all the verses at the bottom. And if you are not 100% familiar with this hymn, it is hard to sit and play at the organ and sing it. <laughs> because your eye has to look at the notes and then go back down to the verses and look at, okay. It was later that uh, the words were put in between the music staves so that you could actually play the music and read the words and sing at the same time. I did find a copy of it eventually. It's a beautiful hymn called Out on Life's Dark Heaving Ocean. Winds and waves around us rave. In the tempest's wild commotion, friend of sinners, shield and save. Vain are all our weak endeavors. Thou our guide and helper be. Star of hope in danger, cheer us. Help us, help, help can only come from thee. What a beautiful hymn. And uh, Dewart did write a lot of material using ocean themes, sailors, ships, and all of that, because that was the environment that he was in. Now, I did find another beautiful hymn that he wrote, fortunately. O thou who hast in every age thy trusting people safely led. So, of course, there's a lot of theme of danger, threats, yet God is always there for his people in one way or another. This is a five-verser. It's not too long. Very stately, very stately, very stately hymn. It uses an old tune called, well, it's actually not that old, called Quebec. Hmm, I need to research this composer and see if he's actually Canadian or not. I think it's an American. Quebec is a tune that was used a lot in those old shape note hymnals that I was talking about. Those old harmony hymnals and this harp and that harp and this harmony. Quebec does appear a lot in there, so I actually think it is an American uh, tune. Okay. But I think you're going to like this nice and stately. Another thing, you will be familiar with this tune because we Presbyterians use it to take up thy cross and follow me. But in our hymnal, they change the melody slightly. This is another interesting thing. As a music director myself, when I go and find older sources of hymn tunes, how different they are. And you'll hear that there are a few differences in this. Thou who hast in me. 
us who in thy work engage thy spirit's guiding influence shed as moon and stars their beams unite to guilt and gladden every soul so blend thy word and works their light to make thy grace and beauty known on those who sow in youthful minds the seeds of harvest yet to be bestow the living faith that binds the heart in loyal love to thee. Protect our youth from every foe and lead in paths of truth and peace as they in age and knowledge faith and holiness increase. So to thy church in wisdom taught, may men of nobler life be given until by holy deeds and thought this world is lifted nearer Amen. Very interesting hymn that is talking about outreach to youth and teaching youth to walk the way, right? Here's a very interesting little, <laughs> little sideline for you now that I spoke about the way. Did you know that the term Christian was originally a derogatory term that the Romans used against the, con the Jewish converts? They were Jewish people who converted and started to follow Christ, and the Romans hated them. And Christian was actually a derogatory term that was used when they were thrown into the arenas with the lions. And later on, when I'm going to talk about instruments in churches, that was the start of the use of the organ. Isn't that sad? <laughs> Actually, the glad thing is that now we can use it to praise God, not cover up the screams of people being torn apart by lions. In the ancient days, those early converts were actually called followers of the way. Interesting. Funny how history plays out and how things can change, right? And for the longest time, this is why a lot, especially the Protestant churches, refused to use the pipe organ because there was still that pagan link, and they did not want this in their churches. The Roman Catholics, of course, took off and flew with it and built magnificent big pipe organs, and that was another reason for them not to want to use them. And then later on, of course, they realized that it is a powerful instrument that can lead in worship strongly. Now we go to a lady composer. There has been a lot of confusion about this lady because a lot of her hymns appear in two different names. One before she was married and one after she was married. And in some cases, she's even called Annie instead of Anna. So as you can see there, her name there at the top, the walker, is her unmarried name. And below is her husband's surname, Coghill. 
Um, she came from England, she was born there, and she did die there, so she returned. While she was in Canada, she worked a lot with children, children's schools, she wrote a lot of material, little storybooks and poems for children. And uh, she was also very much involved in uh, women's movements. There was a, a temperance movement going on all over the, the, the Western world. And she was heavily involved in that. That is when she wrote this hymn that I'm going to be singing for you called Work for the Night is Coming. So this is an English transport into Canada and then she did go back. Uh, for the longest time, <laughs> I don't know that hymn. <laughs> okay, so for the longest time there was confusion over the names until eventually it was sorted out. Okay, Walker, it's the same woman. She did get married once she went back to Britain. Now, the significance of Work for the Night is Coming is that she did write it while she was in Canada in teaching and working with children. Uh, very powerful. It was used a lot, of course, like I said, in the temperance movements. So I shall sing all three verses. If you know these hymns, do feel free to sing along, please. I love hearing people sing. Then I don't feel like I'm just up here performing, but we're actually worshipping. Lovely. The night is coming, work through the morning hours, work while the dew is sparkling, work mid springing flowers, work when the day grows brighter, work in the glowing sun, work for the night is coming when man's work is done. Work for the night is coming, work through the sunny noon, fill brighter stars with labor, rest comes sure and soon. Give every flying minute something to keep in store. Work for the night is coming when man works no more. Work for the night is coming under the sunset skies. While their bright tints are glowing, work for daylight flies. Work till the last beam fadeth, fadeth to shine no more. Work while the night is darkening, when man's work So this is another one of those hymns that eventually became popular in the early gospel movements because it's talking about working for Christ before his return, right? And before our time is done on earth. Real, real gospel movement there. I do have a, a composer here and it is absolutely impossible to find the material that he wrote, unfortunately. Um, I don't actually have him on there. Uh, his name was Silas Tertius Rand, and uh, he was born in Nova Scotia and died in Canada as well. 
he was notorious, now listen to this, he was notorious for taking English poetry and hymns and translating them into Latin. I don't know why. He was apparently a polyglot. He could pick up languages within a couple of months. He was very, very instrumental in reaching out to the Mi'kmaq First Nations people. He learned their language very quickly and was fluent in under a year. And he actually was the one who created a dictionary and a grammar book on the Mi'kmaq language. And of course, he translated a lot of English uh, material and hymns into the Mi'kmaq language. Uh, Rock of Ages, uh, they've got an example here in Latin, is really, really interesting. Uh, Rock of Ages in Latin is Rupe sec, uh, Seculorum. Rupe Seculorum Te. <laughs> it is just insane. So yeah, I, I really, really hunted high and low to try and find something that he actually wrote. And uh, they don't really give Ah, there is a Baptist hymn, Jesus, my Lord, my God, Redeemer, blessed. But yeah, I, I could not find any tunes or any hymns that he actually wrote, which is pretty sad. Our next fellow, Charles Innes Cameron, was, on the other hand, very productive and another Presbyterian minister. Uh, he was born in Scotland, passed away in Ottawa, New Edinburgh. Did we say Burra, Edinburgh? I think that the, the Scottish people say Burra instead of Burg, Edinburgh. Um, his hymns do appear in the early Presbyterian Book of Praise. The first one came out sort of in the late 1800s. It's kind of late for, for a congregation to come out with a hymnal. So right up until the mid 1800s, they were still using hymn books from, from England and Scotland. And then eventually uh, the Presbyterian Church of Canada published their book of praise in the later 1800s. This is a really lovely hymn that uh, they give us a, an example there. And thank goodness I found the music for it. Oh, fair the gleams of glory and bright the scenes of mirth. It is, don't you just love that old language? It is just so, so, in, so expressive and really, really beautiful. So I will be singing that song for you. There are four verses. I need to remind myself that it is two pages and don't get to the end or bottom of page one and wonder where's the rest of the hymn. I've never heard this tune before. I have never heard this hymn before. I stumbled on it on hymnary.org. Thank goodness. And what a beautiful old hymn. It really is. Even the music is interesting. So wait till you hear this. Again, it is simple, it's dignified, but it is so lovely. One of those gems that have almost been lost. of birth that lighten human story and cheer this weary earth but richer for our treasure with whom the spirit dwells ours ours in heavenly measure the glory that excels Lamplight faintly gleameth where shines the noonday ray. From Jesus' face there beameth the light a sevenfold day, and earth's pale lights all fadeth, the light from heaven dispels, but shines for a unshaded the glory that excels no broken cisterns need they who drink from living rills no other music heed they whom God's own music thrills her 
Earth's precious things are tasteless, its boisterous mirth repels. Where flows in measure wasteless the glory that excels. Since on a life descended those beams of light and love, our steps have heavenward tended, our eyes have looked above, till through the clouds concealing the home where glory dwells, our Jesus comes revealing the glory that excels. You know what, some of this stuff, I have actually started teaching to our congregation here at St. John's. A lot of the things that I've dug up, new discoveries that I've made, I'm actually starting to use them and introduce them to our congregation. So it's wonderful, you know, just keeping it alive, keeping it going, and the people here love these songs. They really, really do. Now we're moving on to Frederick George Scott. This uh, gentleman, of course, was born and died in Quebec. So he's as Canadian as you can get, right? Uh, I'm assuming with a name like Frederick George Scott that he didn't, well, he could have spoken French, of course, but he wasn't a Frenchman. He wrote a beautiful, beautiful hymn that uh, the Anglicans love. Of course, he did write for the uh, Church of England in Canada. Cast thy cares on Jesus, make him now thy friend. Tell him all thy troubles, trust him to the end. And uh, St. George the Martyr, which worships here, the, the High Anglican Church, does actually sing that quite often. Um, he wrote a lot of poetry. And actually, uh, a volume of his was called Hymn of Empire. Never heard of it. I would love to find it and read this guy's poetry. He was the rector of a church in Quebec. So, of course, he had a strong... Ah, he even got the, the title reverend. So he did work at St. Matthew's Church in Quebec. He wrote music about Canadian troops returning from South Africa. I'm assuming this is after the Boer War. It's amazing how many Canadians were involved in that, being ex-South African. It's sort of like, I have people saying, ah, oh, you're South African. Ah, oh, my great-grandfather was in the Boer War. And I'm like, my mom's a Boer. <laughs> so chances are your great-grandfather was probably fighting mine. Ouch! <laughs> Fortunately, all those things are in the past now. So I will now sing for you this beautiful hymn, Cast Thy Care on Jesus. Now listen again. There you have that stately, it's a very simple hymn, simple tune, but absolutely elegant and, and very, very beautiful for stately worship.
path he trod. Cast thy care on Jesus, nothing is too small, for his vast compassion he can feel for all. In the gloom and darkness, clasp his living hand. He will guide and cheer thee through the desert land. thy care on Jesus, tell him all thy sin, all thy fierce temptations, and the wrong within. He himself was tempted, and he thy care on Jesus, what is death to those who in deep submission on his love repose, but a short step shall see him and be satisfied. Amen. My eye just fell on a very interesting point here about Canon Scott, that he actually rescued a man from drowning <laughs> in Quebec, and he was, he was presented with the gold medal of the Royal Canadian Humane Association. Wow, yeah, while I was singing the hymn, my eye went over and then I go, wait, what? <laughs> I've got to share that with my people. Our next hymn uh, is not in this, this old book, this is some information that I just drew off the internet at random. My Jesus, I love thee. We all know this hymn, right? It was written through and through by a Canadian, William R. Featherstone. Now, the very sad thing about this is that, uh, the beautiful thing is that when he was 16, he experienced his conversion experience where he opened himself up and the Holy Spirit and Christ came into him. That is, they believe that is when he wrote this hymn. At the age of 16, he wrote, My Jesus, I love thee. He only lived till 27. He was married and he had a little boy of three. So that, that is the sad part. They don't say how he died or, or from what he passed away. But so young, I mean, he wasn't even 30 yet. And it's very interesting that this hymn that he wrote almost talks about, is, is almost talking about his death because he's talking about dying but being, you know, he will love Jesus through everything, even through death, even, even through that sleep and even when he wakes up on the other side. So it's, it's, it's almost eerie how this hymn almost portents what he's going to be experiencing a little bit later in life. 27, can you imagine? Leaving behind a young wife and a little boy. So my Jesus, I love thee. Very, very moving.
I, Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, just so beautiful I actually got a lump in my throat yeah here is a very interesting story with our closing hymn his eyes on the sparrow yes it's Canadian believe it or not famous throughout the gospel singing world written by a Canadian very interesting name this lady has Sevilla Durfee Martin and uh, this is that hymn that I mentioned, where it was used by evangelists a lot, especially Sankey, and she saw that this hymn appeared in a hymnal and was attributed to him. And she tracked everything down, she tracked everybody down, the printer, Ira D. Sankey himself, and uh, said, mm, it was written by me. So, <laughs> good for her. Um, a, a hymn of encouragement. This, this, is, this is more of a real gospel hymn. It should almost be done at the piano more. But I will whip up some vibrato and give you a nice Hammond D sound on this organ. This organ can sound like a theater organ, by the way, by a whirl, like a Wurlitzer. It's, <laughs> I see our members who come every Sunday, every once in a while, I play around with it, and they're like, yeah, yeah, it can. So his eyes on the sparrow, which is biblical, 
Why should I worry? Why should I feel discouraged? If his eyes on the sparrow, guess what? It's definitely on me. So we will use this one as the closer. If you know it, and I've got a feeling most, if not all of you do, do join in. Really, really good song. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path he leads me, but can one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to Him. From care He sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. (laughs) 
How did you like that? <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. During the Victorian era, before I sign off, that song, which is so uplifting, was accused of being in the parlor style. Oh, people were like against it because it sounded like parlor music. Isn't it gorgeous though? Look at the words, the tune is so uplifting, why not, right? So there were different splits going on, even in the Victorian era and everything, you know, there were those who were like, no, you know, it's got to be like this all form and formula, it's all got to be, oh, you know, no, let, let's do parlor songs. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I love it all, because the faith expressed is so simple, it's straightforward, there's no wishy-washiness, no changing of words, lest you step on somebody's toes and hurt their feelings. Okay, the truth is right there, right there. And that is what I love about them. And you can see where we, where we come from. And be careful where we might be erroring and veering away from facts and truth. Uh, some of them may be brutal. But there are truths in there that we should all carry with us and share with those around us. If you see someone struggling with something, and uh, you, know, you can share it in a less brutal way, I suppose. But I love these hymns because it, it is so right there in, in your face. What a lovely song to end off with. Um, our next session will be on the 20th. There seems to be a story floating around that this is the final one. No, it's not. This may go on indefinitely. So don't be fooled. Um, we will carry on. This is section, uh, uh, session 16. We're going on to 17. Hard to believe that we're almost hitting the 20 mark but it is absolutely marvelous. We're going to start now looking at modern hymnody. Okay, and of course, this is coming from a broad range of sources, so don't think that they're all necessarily Presbyterian or Scottish, but this is modern hymnody that has been coming into the Presbyterian church. Um, I need to seek very carefully because here is where copyright becomes an issue, okay? So I may have to contact some people, or I may go online and log on to CCLI, a very wonderful website. It's a paid subscription website where you can download, print, and sing copyright songs. And then CCLI makes sure that all the people who wrote the music gets the royalties for that. Uh, a few of these did actually come from, that last one came from CCLI. Believe it or not, I could have changed the key, and I didn't. Originally, it's in a very high key. For those who know music, that high note was an F sharp. <laughs> La! There you go. So thank you for being here. Please, it would be lovely to see you all again on the 20th as we carry on into the modern era in 